What is consciousness? How are we able to be aware, thinking and feeling? Why do we have this sense of identity that we are separate from the rest of the universe? And how does physical matter give rise to consciousness? In this video, we'll discuss all about consciousness and my thoughts on it. It is so appealing to feel like consciousness, this experience we have, is somehow a separate existence from the rest of the world that is somehow special that there's something more grander happening there's something mystical about consciousness we love to feel like that so of course we're going to over inflate the importance of consciousness because it's all we know because consciousness is so real to us that we can't fathom it any other way but if we want to ask these big questions what is consciousness where does it come from we have to concede to the possibility that consciousness is just like every other physical phenomenon there is. And as far as I can see, there is no evidence that consciousness is somehow beyond the physical realm that we're used to. So how do we explain consciousness physically? In order to explain this, we have to go back to evolution. How did we evolve consciousness? We have a great understanding in neuroscience now that the brain is what really processes all of our sensory systems. The first place to look is gonna be the brain, obviously. But our brains are large. They have billions of neurons and trillions of synapses. It would be impossible to map out all the neurons in our brain. We have to start somewhere smaller, like in worms. And we did. Back in 2012, a study came out where they mapped out the entire connecto. All the synapses and the neurons of the brain of a worm were mapped out. There were only about 300 neurons in the neural network of this worm. And scientists were able to discover about three different types of neurons. Some were for sensory systems, sensing temperatures and chemicals in the environment or environmental cues. Some neurons were connected directly to muscles in the worm, enabling it to move in certain ways. So we know that neurons are integral to having this sense of experience we have today, which are just cells like every other cell in your body. The cells in your brain are no different than the cells in the rest of your body. It's just that they have specific tasks. Some have receptors in them, which take in chemicals from the outside world and are able to sense certain things. So the scientists in this study were able to discover a, a few of these neurons that were capable of distinguishing between their environment and themselves. In other words, neurons able to establish identity as if we are a single being and the outside world is a separate thing. And that is the beginning of consciousness. And it starts with this electrochemical action going on in the neuron. And these neurons can actually work together. They can simultaneously work together in pairs and groups and networks and collectively process even more senses. So we can see that as these neural networks evolved, they became more complicated over time into something like we know today in a human brain. 300 million years ago, Tiktaalik was one of the first land animals to rise from the waters and walk on land. In the oceans, light doesn't travel very far because a lot of water is in the way. But in air, light is able to travel further, which means that animals that were walking on land for the first time were able to see further. And this could have been what drove these animals to be able to sense things further away and have this sense of time, this past and future. In the oceans, fish only had maybe three seconds to react to things. But up in the air, now they're able to see things from, you know, hundreds of feet away, which now forces their brains to adapt and recognize that there is a time delay between things in front of you and then coming towards you. Longer time frames in our minds had to be understood. Longer memories. This information had to be kept and stored longer as we move out into the land. And this evolution kept going with reptiles and mammals than humans, as we saw more habitats more that required different types of consciousness and brain power. Another study demonstrates that consciousness also likely arose due to emotional influences. So with the brain adapting, this enabled our brain power to grow when it comes to emotions. This is likely when all these deep thoughts and feelings emerged in our ancestors' minds. And a couple years ago, another study came out where they mapped the entire connectome of a fly. Thousands of neurons, hundreds of thousands of synapses. And what they found was the entire brain was working together, where signals were being propagated all throughout the brain, interconnected, moving back and forth. 
nearly half the neurons were seeing recurrent inputs being used multiple times. And their brain was split into two hemispheres, much like ours. And these two hemispheres can connect with each other as well. So now we see a more extensive neural network, an entire structure called a brain. But what about these processes? Yields thoughts. Like how do we experience physically this experience that we're feeling right now? What physically is that? Well, to begin with, brains we now know have modules, which are grouped neurons of similar types. And all of our cells in our bodies have voltage and the sense of action potential. In other words, our cells contain things like potassium, sodium, and chloride ions, each with their different positive or negative charges. And if enough charge is built up in a particular cell, enough negative charge, and the outside of the cell is a positive charge, well, now your cell has voltage or action potential. Certain voltages allow certain cells to be produced and certain new connections require certain voltages. Human cells, each one of your cells in your body can generate 25 millivolts of electricity. And the human body has 50 trillion cells. And that's how we experience the world through this electricity. We are bioelectric beings experiencing the world through electrochemical, biochemical phenomenon. On a smaller scale, your cells are operating through voltages. And on a larger scale is this gigantic network of neurons working together, producing every thought, every feeling you have, every sense of pain you have and guilt and fear and sadness and happiness. All these things are electrochemical reactions occurring in your body. If I were to hit my arm right now, I felt that pain because the cells in my skin have receptors in them. And when they get stimulated by the impact, receptors in my skin cells send signals throughout my nerve endings. They get sent through my nerve endings due to voltage all the way up to my brain. And my brain alerts the other neurons and says, hey, there's pain here. There's pain here. There's a global network inside of my body, throughout my brain, throughout every part of my body. Every cell in your body operates through electrochemistry. So as a collective, we are bioelectric beings, which is fascinating to understand. Now we'll have a better understanding of what a thought is. A thought is that electrochemical response happening inside of your neurons. Those are thoughts. When I close my eyes and I think of a unicorn or a horse, those are electrochemical impulses being produced in the brain. What I am seeing in my mind my visual cortex is generating these electrochemical impulses. And that's what I see. That's how we observe the world. In all of our sensory systems, from our eyes to our tongues, our taste buds, our nose, all of these are filtering in data from the outside world. Light beams into my eye. My eye gets stimulated. The cones inside my eye get stimulated. They produce signals that get sent back into my brain, my visual cortex. My visual cortex lights up electrochemically and those neurons produce these thoughts that I'm seeing in my mind. We are seeing those electrochemical impulses and that's what makes our experience real to us. That's what consciousness seems to be. And amazingly, scientists using functional MRI, they're able to image these thoughts. They're able to take images of our brain waves, convert them into text. We can now use computers and AI to turn your thoughts into actual images and text that we can see in computers. And that's amazing. Now, of course, this is not the whole picture of consciousness. Of course, there's much more to it. But the point is that we have the ability to come up with a model that explains our experience as beings. Now, as a human, of course, our consciousness is in a much more deeper level than, for example, an insect or a worm. And the reason being is because our neural networks are much more advanced than theirs. So the notion that there's one force that makes you conscious, there's one object that makes you conscious versus not conscious, that doesn't exist. There are degrees of consciousness biologically that we can actually measure now. For example, Pat Churchland has done studies on this where she took propanol and gave it to certain patients and observed their consciousness dwindle down over time and come back up again, right? These are basic, you know, uh, anesthesia, 
that they give to patients and they can observe consciousness wave in and out. They can measure the bodily functions shutting down as they mess with the brain. And they can also do this with out of body experiences. Scientists can now give people hallucinations and there've been many studies on this. They give patients hallucinogens and they can induce out of body experiences, induce all kinds of dreams and thoughts in the mind. We have a good understanding that the brainstem has to do with consciousness as well. An alteration of the brainstem can also alter degrees of consciousness. So we know there's a very good correlation between the brain and consciousness. And this is all evidence that we have a decent model as to explaining what consciousness is. So now when we look at the hard problem of consciousness, as philosophers call it, the idea that there has to be something non-physical or more fundamental or, or something different that explains why we feel things and see the color red and, and experience blueness. Well, no, we, we, we now know that that doesn't have to be the case. The experience that we have is the bioelectricity. Our experience is that emergent phenomenon. And just because we don't have the exact mechanism that yields this phenomenon doesn't mean it can't be that phenomenon. And it definitely doesn't mean that consciousness has to be fundamental or has to be outside of the physical realm. And philosophers will use this uh, zombie thought experiment where they try to say consciousness can't be physical because I can imagine a zombie who is just like me, but doesn't have consciousness. It acts, it acts just like me. It talks like me. It says everything I say, but it doesn't have consciousness. So there's got to be something non-physical that explains, you know, why consciousness arises. But th that just undermines the entire point. Because if, if you can conceive of a zombie that has all the same behaviors as me, but is not conscious, then what you are admitting by that very statement is that consciousness has nothing to do with behaviors. What you're saying now is that there's something beyond our behaviors that determine our consciousness, which means that according to the panpsychist, we might not be conscious right now. Because even though I behave as if I think I'm conscious, it's not my behavior, it's something in the ether, it's something in the platonic realm that gives me consciousness. It's, it's not here in the physical, it's somewhere else. It has nothing to do with my physical behaviors or responses. Well, that's that seems ridiculous. So. The panpsychist doesn't actually have any, any explanatory power in explaining why we're conscious. All they're doing is just saying, well, it's got to be non-physical. When we not only can explain why we're conscious physically, we can actually explain more about our conscious experience than any panpsychist. Somebody who thinks that there's no physical derivation of consciousness. No, the physical is enough. And it explains why we are conscious and rocks are not conscious. Whereas a panpsychist would have to explain why rocks are not conscious it has nothing to do with the physical arrangement of the atoms, right? But the physicalist can say that rocks don't have neural networks, right? That's why they don't have that experience of consciousness like we do. So it seems like physicalism is a perfectly valid explanation for why we are conscious and how we experience. And just like life for the past few thousand years was seen as something magical, that there was some magical force behind life, that there was some kind of soul in Latin, soul means the breath of life so people in the past our ancestors thought that there was some magical life force that was going in and moving out of people making them alive or dead that it was black and white right you're either alive or dead well now we know there's a bit more nuance than that we now know that life emerges from physical matter itself non-life can yield living entities because life is a process just as consciousness is, em is an emergent process of the interactions of our molecules in our body. We experience the world through this bioelectricity and uh, identity, the sense of we are separate from the rest of the universe. That is just an illusion brought about by, by these interactions. And just like our long lived expectations that life was somehow a magical mystical force beyond the realms of physics, that idea is slowly faded away, now seems ridiculous. Perhaps consciousness will one day be just like life. Our descendants will look back on us who once thought that consciousness was some kind of magical force and laugh at us. If consciousness is physical, 
look at the implications of that. That by natural chance, these molecules out in the universe that are on their own, not conscious, but when they come together collectively under certain ways over many, many years can yield something like me and you living conscious beings who can think and feel and love and compose music and poetry and do these remarkable things. That is something to be proud of. Consciousness would be more amazing because it's physical, because it probabilistically arises from these from this natural matter. I feel like we're doing a disservice to ourselves to just simply dismiss the fact that consciousness could be physical. We resort to some magic. No, I think the physical realm has room for magic as well. And that's us, is our consciousness. <laughs>